the only difference between a six and a nine figure seller is that the nine figure seller found better products they launched them more frequently and they drove traffic to them more effectively which is why in this video i'm going to give you my complete product launch playbook which covers how to find different products how to drive traffic how to create good listing content how to uh, forecast inventory and forecast sales how to budget for the ppc and pretty much how to do anything that you need to do to launch your product effectively and make it profitable within the first three months I put everything on a notion doc as usual and i'm going to leave it in the description of this video you can open it up uh look through it later or you can use it to follow through what i'm saying i have some details there that i haven't mentioned in the video and i'm about to screen share it with you right now and take you through it all right so this is the notion doc i'm going to share with you guys for free in the description uh over here and in the video obviously we're going to cover everything so i'm going to take you through like what type of products to launch the main metrics you should be looking at how to track success benchmarks for like stocking up getting as many units as you should have uh running ads how to budget for ads what type of campaigns to run what listing content to have so i'm going to cover pretty much everything here um this is the playbook that i've launched um over 300 different products with over the last 16 months i'm giving it all away for free so let me just start with the actual metrics that we should look at both pre and post launch and those are how much traffic you're getting because if you don't get people looking at your product detail page you're never going to win how much that traffic costs you if that traffic costs a lot then you don't have the money to spend that much uh, on ads for example it's not going to go well for you or if your aov is too low compared to the cost of traffic which is something i'll mention later on it's also not going to work out for you so how much that traffic costs you how much of it converts if you spend a whole lot of money driving a bunch of traffic and you convert one percent of it on like a 20 dollars effort selling price product it's just not going to work out then finally, what those margins are. If you watch, uh, sorry, if you launch a 5% like gross margin, and that's like after FBA and Amazon's cut and everything, uh, product, you're just not going to be able to afford to run ads to it and actually make money if you're doing private table. So over here, I've split out all of these metrics into pre-launch and post-launch. So for traffic, pre-launch, you just want to make sure that there's enough of it. So you want to go to the top search terms report in brand analytics, and you kind of want to make sure that your um you know potential products like top search terms are at least within the 10,000 highest search volume keywords on amazon that's my personal opinion if you're a smaller brand and you don't want to launch that big of a product like if an extra product at like five thousand dollars a month in sales is going to move the needle for you then that requirement changes a bit but i'm kind of addressing this to bigger like seven and maybe early eight like figure brands um those are the ones that are going to, need to pay attention more to having like a product with keywords that are top 10,000 at least on the platform because launching anything lower than that probably won't move the needle as much for them right after that generally I'd go into helium 10 uh grab a few of the top competitors ASINs and throw them in Cerebro then I just order everything by search volume and you want to make sure that at least a few of the very highly relevant keywords have 1,000 to 3,000 plus uh monthly searches right anything below that again and not enough units are going to be moving so these are my general traffic requirements this changes like if you have one product and you're doing five thousand dollars a month in sales if you launch another product and it does another five thousand dollars a month in sales for you you might be happy with that so you don't need to be as um i guess strict with the traffic requirements just because the type of products that you're trying to launch don't need to really sell that much if you're someone doing you know half a million a month a million a month then you want to really pay attention to the actual search volumes and like the traffic and everything that you could potentially drive uh the second thing is cost of traffic so you want to look at what your cpcs are going to be like there are several tools that can help you predict cpcs uh, on a keyword level pretty sure helium 10 will give it to you for some keywords um then you could also just do it based on general like knowledge of the category so if you're launching something else in a category that you're already in uh that would probably be um, a good indicator of what the cpc would be if you have another product in the same category another thing you'd want to do is maybe go out ask other brand owners what they're paying ask agency owners or consultants what they've seen others pay if you're in any communities like million dollar sellers or in any discord group you generally can just ask people there what cpc they're paying and if you're in a big enough category you'll usually find someone to give you an answer so you want to figure out what like a reasonable cpc is to expect and then you want to look at two things your budget and your average order value so if you have a one thousand dollar per month advertising budget and it looks like you're going to pay like six seven or even five dollars per click uh, that means you're going to get 200 or less clicks 
per month, right? And initially your conversion rate's gonna be pretty bad. So that's like six units a month that you've just sold, which isn't enough to launch a product and isn't enough obviously to turn a profit anytime soon. So that's the first thing. The uh, potential or like expected CPC has to match the budget that you have. You can't have like a super expensive CPC and then try to run ads with like five, $600 a month worth of budget. That's the first thing. The second thing is AOV. Uh, some categories or some products are super competitive, like coffee, for example, and they don't have a super high AOV. So unless you're selling like bulk coffee, you're probably going to have like a $10, $20 average selling price. And if your cost per click on that is going to be 6 or $7, then, you know, you can expect not to make a profit for a very long time, right? Because it's going to take a lot of money to rank organically for anything. And it's going to take a lot of money to sell to enough new to brand customers to actually get those recurring orders, which will actually put real profit into your pockets and so on. Same goes with things like, you know, salt uh, is probably another competitive one, uh, supplements, all that other stuff. So you have to be super aware. And if it's something like super generic, like I don't know, a pack of crayons, then you can usually expect that the CPC on it will be a bit high. Right, so you just have to make sure that those numbers make sense for both your budget and your profit expectations. If you want to turn a profit on month number two, you can't pay like a seven dollar click on like a twenty dollar product just because it has like recurring customers, because that's going to take some time to build up and some time for you to actually break even on. Right. After that is CVR. Um, you just want to launch with a good listing. So I'm going to cover like an example of a good and a bad listing later. But you generally just want to launch with a good listing. Uh, part of that is obviously the reviews. So if you have, you know, a competitor with 30,000 reviews and, uh, you know, you're launching a copycat product with zero reviews, then, you know, you can guess that you're not going to do that well. Uh, so reviews is a part of it. So I want to see how you're going to get reviews. Uh, price is another part because if you have no reviews and no social proof, most people are either going to buy on price or product. It's usually going to be price unless you have like a kind of innovative kind of special product. So price is going to be a big one. After that, you want to kind of look at the type of product that, you, uh, that you're that you launching, right? Because like six years ago, maybe, you could launch anything pretty much. And you could expect within a reasonable degree that it's going to work out. Today, it's not exactly like that. So you want to be careful with what you launch. And again, if someone's already out there pushing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of sales per month on this product, you have tens of thousands of reviews or even six figures worth of reviews, and you're just trying to copy what they do and launch it at the same price or higher, then it's generally not going to work out. So you have to be careful with the type of product that you're selling. Finally, margin. Each category is different, but generally I like to see at least a 30% margin. Uh, it's just generally what is going to give you enough room to both advertise and make a profit. And it also gives you a margin of safety uh, in case like fees increase in the future, whether that's like CPC is going up, or like you're starting to have to pay more for shipping and so on. So that's uh, probably the final rule of pre-launch, right? Then after that, you have post-launch. For traffic, you're generally looking at two things. Number one is to have a good listing with keywords that you want to index for. So you can start to rank organically once you drive uh, paid traffic. Then number two is to create ads, which I'll cover more in depth later on. Uh, number two, again, is cost of traffic. Initially, the ads you're on are gonna be very expensive not only because of the cost per click, but also because of the lack of reviews. So as long as you're under 20 reviews, I generally just expect like a 70% plus ACoS. So you have to budget for that, right? And then something else is I try to uh, ramp up my spend over time. So we try to have several strategies for getting reviews other than just selling product. And over time, as review count goes up, your performance becomes better. So at the beginning, I tried to spend a bit less then, you know, as I'm kind of progressing and getting more reviews, I try to push more spend in. So if you have like a $10,000 budget, I wouldn't divide it like 5,000 on the first month, 5,000 on the second month. I kind of put less on the first month and a bit more on the second month to give you enough time to ramp up with reviews and actually get some type of return on your ad spend. Uh, after that, we have CVR. At this point, it's mostly going to be tied to product price and reviews, uh, which is essentially what we mentioned earlier. If your product isn't something special, like most of us aren't going to be, you know, inventing like the Ford Model T or anything. But if there's no like actual differentiator, you're probably going to have to drop prices by a bit. So I try to stagger my prices. So at the beginning, I'll maybe be like 30% under market price a month, then I might be 20% under market price and so on. Uh, you kind of want to stagger your pricing to give people an incentive to actually buy 
early on when you have no reviews. And number two is you are going to want to try to launch with some type of reviews. And you can get those in multiple different ways, which we'll cover later. Right. After that, you have your margin. Again, you're not going to be making that much money just because of that ACOS and tackles. So generally what I do is I budget for it. Right? First month or first two months, you're probably going to be losing money. So you'll have a net negative margin. Uh, and you don't want to run out of cash, of course. So I'd budget for that, then try to become profitable around month three, or at least break even on month three. Right. So over here, I spoke earlier about like what type of products to launch and what type of products work. Um, and this is like the in-depth explanation for it. So essentially, like I mentioned, today you can't really launch the same thing that everyone else is launching and expect extraordinary results. Uh, just because Amazon, you know, has almost a product for everything right now. So unless you're coming out with something with like a USP or a unique selling point, it is going to be hard to compete unless there's, you know, insufficient competition in a category and you can kind of capitalize on that, right? So in terms of the uh, type of products that will work, I'll start with USP. So there are common, um, a few different USPs that you can kind of play on uh, to give your product an edge. I'm just going to run through them all. Uh, first thing is size. So if everyone's selling like, I guess, like normal size stuff, you can try to sell like a bulk size product or like a travel size product. If something's only sold in big quantities, you can sell a travel size product. So over here you have bulk sized, um, bulk sized shampoo. So if these guys or girls were to launch like a shampoo bottle to compete with Dove with no other differentiator, they'd probably get squashed. They probably couldn't outsell Dove. And shampoo is like super competitive, so they probably couldn't have done anything in that category with like a regular old shampoo bottle. But over here, they decided to launch bulk shampoo, right? So it started doing well. Um, they have other bigger listings with more ratings, I believe, but they're pushing like several thousand units per month through their other listings as well. So size is number one. Either sell in bulk, bulk sell in like travel sizes. Or just figure out a different way to use size to make it better, whether it's just because it's cheaper when it's bigger or whatever else it is. Uh, selling in bulk can be a strategy if no one else is doing it yet. Uh, second thing is design. So again, this works especially well with, I said over here, apparel and gifts. But what I mean by apparel is anything you're going to be seen with. So over here, that can include like, you know, a water bottle. It can include like a phone case. It can include pretty much anything that you're going to be seen with. So over here, we have an example of a water bottle. Again, water bottles are super competitive, but this brand, Simple Modern, was able to sign a deal with Disney uh, to have like a princess-themed water bottle. And that obviously helped them out, right? So they're selling a lot of this. They have, what is it, like 11,000 reviews, and they're selling probably a lot of units of this bottle uh, just because they have a good design on it, even though it's pretty much a commodity item right now. Uh, obviously, I don't like expect you to go sign a deal with Disney or a deal with whatever other brand it is. But to replicate this, you could maybe design something a bit different, use different patterns, different colors, and so on. This also works with gifts. So if you're selling like candles, you can use like different designs for those candles. Uh, if you're selling jewelry, again, just have like special design jewelry. So you know, it's kind of what you have to do. Um, after that, you have brush. Uh, sorry, not brush. You have brand. I just read the product title there. So you have brand. Uh, again, if you're launching something that's kind of a commodity and a bunch of other people are doing it, but you have a good brand and you have existing branded traffic and you have people who are loyal to you and people who might want to buy from you at a higher price, then that's a USP in of itself, even if the product itself is just like generic and has nothing else special about it. The actual brand can actually carry you to profits. So over here, we have an example of a brand called Fuller Brush. They sell an $80 carpet sweeper. Um, and generally these carpet sweepers are sold for like $20 or $30, but they're actually the second highest selling like brand in this category in terms of units and in terms of actual revenue, they're doing more than anyone just because their product costs a lot more. So they're, they have a higher AOV and they're selling almost as many units as the top performer, right? So brand is big. Uh, after that we have cost plus price. I usually cost, uh, call this cost engineering just because um it's not about just being cheaper and eating up your margins it's also about like being smart about how to be cheaper right so over here i gave two examples number one is bulk supplements so bulk supplements was the first brand on amazon to sell supplements in plastic bags right so earlier what happened 
was if you were selling supplements, you would sell it in these big containers. And that would mean two things. Number one, uh, it's bigger. So it costs more to ship. Number two, that container costs more money. So what they did was they slimmed it down and they just put it in a plastic bag and they sold it in bulk. So that allowed them to be a lot cheaper than what was already out there, right? So this was cost or price engineering because they thought of a smart way uh, to essentially like, you know, decrease their own cogs so that they could reflect that in the end price for the customer. This is one example. The second example is the uh, step stool that I have over here. And the reason this one is special is because usually step stools are sold as one piece. So it's just like this piece um, that you just take out of the box and start using. And what these guys did was they sold like a step stool that you could assemble. So instead of being shipped as just one massive piece, it was actually shipped as two pieces that are like, I guess they go, they move into each other. So you can put them into each other and you can ship them in a box of this size. So it's like a box of this size. So that made their shipping costs, you know, both from China and to the customer, a lot cheaper. And uh, that allowed them to be a lot cheaper again in terms of end price for the customer. So this was another example of cost slash price engineering. Uh, after that, you have features and add-ons. Uh, so over here, I have an example of a uh, piano like sticker key uh, thing. So essentially, kids take these piano stickers. They stick it on each key, and it tells them, like, this is a D, this is an E, an F, a G, whatever else it is. And again, it's almost a commodity item uh, just because everyone's selling the same exact thing. So what this brand did was it added a uh, lesson book with that, like, set of stickers. So that the end like customer could, I guess, put all of the stickers on their piano keys and at the same time use this lesson book to learn how to play the piano. So it's kind of differentiated them. Plus, it allowed them to have a much higher average order value. So they have a $13 average order value. And from my memory, everyone else was sub $10. So they have a much higher average order value, meaning they can pay more per click. And they have uh, probably better margins. Uh, then finally uh you know they just have a differentiator so people are both more likely to click on their product more likely to convert uh they're more likely to have a better margin on this and they have an a higher average order value so this is like a good example of a useful feature and add-on another thing could be like a recipe book that comes with like a utensil kit uh, or whatever else it is right after that you have aov or average order value um so the thing is with amazon that uh, customer clicks don't scale with average order value. So if you have like a $50 product, you could be paying like a dollar per click. And if you have like a $500 product, you're probably paying like two, three, four, five dollars per click, right? So it doesn't actually scale linearly. So even though the price 10x, the cost per click only moves for 5x. So that's good if you sell an expensive product. But at the same time, if you sell a cheaper product, then uh, the cost per click is going to eat at all of your margin. So over here, in this example, we have a $5 product, right? And uh, this $5 product uh, is competitive. It's in a competitive space. It's sea salt. So the cost of a click there is going to be super high. You're probably looking at at least a couple dollars or more. And they're only selling a $5 product, right? So if they need, what is it, like 10 clicks to convert, that's going to be $20 in ad spend to sell a $5 product. So it just doesn't work out, right? The only way this works out is if they rank super high and they start to get organic orders and that makes up for a part of it. And they, then they have like repeat customers that like come back and just buy without these ads. And that can work out in the end. But even like after you subtract Amazon's commission, FBA, shipping and everything else, it just becomes very difficult to sell a product like this. The final thing here is competition. Um, some categories are just going to have like huge competitors who are going to be selling a lot more units than you. They're going to have a lot of uh, like brand recognition, a lot of branded traffic that you can't compete with. They are going to have a lot of reviews. They're just going to have a seemingly non-ending budget. An example of this would be baby wipes. Obviously, you can still succeed in an environment like this. It's just going to be difficult, especially if you don't have like the patience, the budget, the people, the time, or whatever else it is to launch this ASIN. You don't want to be going off against like something like this. Like over here, you have Amazon Elements. You have Huggies, you have Dude Wipes. You know, later in the page, you might find that you have Pampers. You have another Amazon brand. I think you have Amazon Basics. So you're just competing with people with massive, massive pockets and unlimited budgets. And, you know, there's very little differentiation in a category like this. So it's just something that's difficult to get into. Right? 
After that, you have listing content. So I'm just going to open both of these up very quickly. Right? Listing content one and two. All right, let me just wait until everything loads in. All right, here we go. So this is the good example. This is the bad example. I'll start with the bad example. You know, most of you probably already spotted it by now, but they have no other images besides the main image. The uh, bullet points are actually like one or two words. The A plus content is non-existent, but the reviews are good. So it kind of does help them. But in general, it's just like a lower performing product. So over here on this second product, uh, you have a few things going. So over here, you have obviously a full set of images. You know, you have before and after images with like an explanation of the type of results you can expect, right? And like a timeline, you have this uh, feature image, right? You have this kind of graph or infographic explaining how it works. Again, you have this other feature image. You have like a collection of the other products that they have uh, that you can also make use of. And they have very benefit-oriented bullet points, right? So slow down time, uh, gentle and efficient, day and night care. All of these just answer questions for the customers. Consistent results, you know, dermatologically developed. So all of these are like benefit-oriented. They have their band story over here. Right, with a bunch of images. Then after that, they have pretty strong A plus content. So they have two things going on here. Number one is they have actual text, and this indexes and helps with SEO. Uh, and number two is obviously they have really good images. So over here, you can see her skin clear up over time and look more youthful. Uh, then again, over here, you have like an explanation for how to use it. Right. And they're just like focusing in on the target audience, which is like middle-aged women. So over here, you can see they're all like middle-aged women, and it shows you how to use everything. Then they actually pick out all of the main, uh, all of the main questions that customers might have, and they're just answering them one by one, which is pretty creative. I haven't seen that with most brands. But over here, what if my skin gets irritated? Then they have like a SEO indexable piece of text explaining what happens. What does, um, I can't pronounce that, non comodigenic mean? Again, explanation. You know, can I get visible results with this? Again, another explanation. And so on. Travel friendly. This might be important to the target audience. I don't know. I don't buy this stuff. And so on. Right? So they have good bullets. Um, really, really good A plus content. That both looks good. Answers all the questions and has SEO indexable text. Uh, then finally, they have a good uh, title, right? With all of the different like features and attributes in there and some of the uh, keywords that you might want to have. Then they have really good images over here. So an overall very strong listing compared to this, which kind of has nothing going for it. So with this, like let's assume you just launched this and you have zero reviews. This is probably sufficient for you to start gaining traction and for you to win. Whereas if you launch with zero reviews, an average price in a listing that looks like this, which is what most product launches are like, uh, you aren't going to get any traction, especially if the product isn't special and if you don't have any brand recognition. Right? Um, so that's for listings. After that, you want to forecast revenue and inventory. So this is a rule that I made up, but generally what I do is I pull out uh, the top few ASINs uh, in like my category or like the type of like product that I'm selling. And what I do is I just take a percentage of their sales. So if the top person is selling like, I don't know, uh, 10,000 units per month, I just estimate, you know, as like an initial number that I'm going to sell 1,000 units a month for the first few months, right? Then what I do after that is I subtract 1% from that number or from like that 10% for every 2,000 reviews that they have, right? So if they have um, 5,000 reviews, I subtract 4%, right? And I do that until I reach a minimum of 2%. So over here in the screenshot, uh, this is like a laser cartridge for your gun to help you like train without using like real ammunition. Uh, they're doing 46,000 in revenue, right? So let's just say 50,000 because I have to do this math in my head. And they have uh, just under 4,000 reviews. So I'll take 10% of that, right, initially. Then I have to look over here and we have one set of 2,000 reviews. You can round this up or not. It's up to you. 
uh, depending on what you want to do. But I'm not going to round it up. So I'll say like minus 2%. That's 8% of 46,000, which is something like 3,700, 3,800 a month. You know, if my math is incorrect, you can just help me out in the comments and maybe tell me what it was. But uh, you've got around like three, three, three or four thousand dollars a month in sales from this. Um, but there are a few things that you want to keep in mind. Number one is branded traffic. So in some categories, you're going to have super, super big brands uh, competing with you. So I was looking at face cream before this because I was going to use that as the example to estimate revenue. Then I saw that Cerave was selling like a face cream. And they obviously did a lot in like in revenue for it. So I was looking at it and they had like something like 8,000 or 18,000 reviews and $600,000 in monthly sales, right? So they were getting a lot of branded traffic. And if I were to launch, even if I only took 2% of that, I probably wouldn't launch with $12,000 a month in revenue, right? So brand uh, and branded traffic obviously affect how much sales uh, you can expect to get first year competitor. So if you're going up against a massive brand like Huggies or Pampers or even Amazon Basics um, and you don't have a brand at all and you have no reviews, then you can't really estimate that you're going to make 10% as much as they do. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, you have to have the budget to actually hit these sales figures. So if you forecast $20,000 in monthly sales and your ad budget is like 400, 500 bucks a month, it's not going to happen, right? Because you're going to need like an astronomically high ROAS for that to work out. And you're not going to get that both in the short and long run just because of how much it costs, uh, how much a click costs right now, plus the fact that you launch with a terrible CVR generally. So you have to actually have the budget to hit these goals. This is more of like a ceiling for how much you could potentially reach if you did have the budget. Uh, after that, for uh, the last thing is repeat purchases. So if you're looking like at a category like cosmetics, like, I don't know, coffee or supplements or anything that's replenishable, uh, generally the top players are going to have a large number of repeat customers coming in. So even if their reviews aren't that high or if it doesn't look that competitive, they're probably doing, you know, five, six, or even maybe if it's a massive product, seven figures, but that's very unlikely, uh, and monthly sales, just like recurring from customers that they don't even have to advertise to get, right? That's like another thing that you have to keep in mind. After that, you have uh, reviews. So reviews are going to be super important to you. So generally, you're never going to become profitable. You're never going to get a good tackles or ACoS if you have no reviews. Uh, and there are a few ways you can fix that. Number one, obviously, before I get into these, it's just selling more product. The more product you sell, the more reviews you're going to have. But, you know, obviously, just like when you launch immediately, you're going to launch with zero sales and zero customers unless you use those other sources, which I'm about to talk about, which means that your potential for getting reviews is very limited, since usually only around 1% of buyers are going to leave a review. Right? So over here, you have a few options to fix that. Uh, number one is Vine. So with Vine, essentially, you can enroll into the program and enroll 30 units in. And what's going to happen is those units will be given for free or actually for a very low price to verified reviewers on Amazon. And those people are forced to leave a review and they're usually like very detailed. They're very long. So you got like a high quality review. There are, you know, usually some images in there and it's just like something good. Obviously, if the star rating ends up being good, but if, if that actual rating is good, then that's probably going to help push the conversion. Even if you don't have that many like individual reviews, a few higher quality ones uh, are going to do you good. So that's the first thing. Uh, they usually leave like four or five star reviews unless your product's bad. And if they're leaving three star reviews, then maybe that's a sign that this product isn't going to work out. And you can usually expect to get around like 20 reviews uh, in the first 30 to 45 days. And that's just going to depend on category. After that, you have off Amazon sources. I split these out into two sections, email lists and friends and family. So for email lists, if you already have like an audience or if you already have like a you know, other e-commerce business off of Amazon, you can direct some of that traffic to Amazon. So just offer them like a deal and say, hey, I'm launching this on Amazon. And then just say like, you can get a discount. If you buy the product, don't incentivize the review. Just tell them like, hey, here's a discount. You can buy this. And then after that, you can say like, hey, uh, thank you for buying that product. Or thank you for like, you know, looking at our product, like considering purchasing it, whatever. Uh, and then you can just say like, I'd really appreciate if you leave a, if you leave a review. 
or like, a, I don't know, a small business or a family owned business, just be honest. Like if you're an enterprise brand, don't do that. But just say like, hey, we actually need those reviews just to get the ball rolling for us. And we'd really appreciate if you'd leave us one. Right. And you don't have to incentivize it. Usually people are going to go in and leave that review, especially if they're loyal customers. Sometimes they only send out this discount email to like the top customers by spend so that they're more likely to number one, obviously engage with the email and number two to leave you a review uh, and obviously have it be a positive, re positive review at the end. Um, after that, you have friends and family. So this is against terms of service, but I generally haven't seen someone get their entire listing yanked for doing this. It has happened before, but it's just unlikely. Uh, so yeah, if you're launching something, you can maybe reach out to like your coworkers or your friends or your family. You can reach out to your mom and she can buy your product and leave you a review. Just be smart with it. Don't get like 55 star reviews in two days. So you can just like supplement your other review earning efforts with this. Uh, and generally nothing's going to happen. Just don't be stupid with the number of reviews that you get in that certain time frame, right? Let's see, you have illegal sources. Uh, you can choose to use these or not. I generally tell people not to use them, but you have review groups and review services. So generally there are groups uh, where you can pay like a certain amount of money and you can start to get hundreds of reviews very fast. Obviously that improves your conversion rate overnight, but you are always going to get caught one day and your listing is always going to get yanked. And if you do this too much, maybe you can even risk, uh, I think I saw some people get sued over this. I think I saw some account suspensions too. So you want to be careful with this. Uh, sometimes people do this and they get away with it for years. So there are people who did this four years ago and their listings are still live and they made a lot of money doing this and they weren't affected by it at all. So you can test your luck. I generally wouldn't recommend it. Um, but uh, that is always an option if you want to get things moving, and moving faster. After that, you have incentivized reviews. Again, you can give people money indirectly through like a gift card or something. Uh, after they buy your product to leave a review. So what some sellers will do is they'll slip like a card in to like their uh, the package that they're selling the product in. And I will say like, hi, thank you for buying from our business. Please leave a, leave a five-star review and take a screenshot and send it to XYZ email if you want to get a $100 Amazon gift card. And again, this can increase your review percentage from like 1% to, I don't really do this honestly because it's illegal, but probably like 10% or more. Uh, so this obviously increases the number of reviews that you got very fast. So these are like your options for getting reviews. After that, you can start driving traffic. So you have your uh, winner product with like good margins, good USPs and good listing content. Uh, you started to get some reviews either by enrolling in Vine or by reaching out to your friends and family or your email list or trying some of the legal stuff that I don't recommend. Uh, then it comes time to actually drive traffic. So over here, you have a few strategies that you can use. I'm just going to run you through each one. The first one is branded. Uh, so with branded, essentially what you're doing is you're advertising on your brand's own keywords. So if I'm selling like, um, I don't know, like Nike shoes, I might advertise on the keyword Nike in phrase and like a um, sponsored product campaign, right? And generally, even when you have no reviews, these will convert well. So you can maybe get like a 20, 30, 40% ACoS on these with very little reviews. So if you have decent brand traffic, this is option number one, and this is definitely what you should be doing before ever running generic traffic, especially if your budget's not high. Uh, after that, you have research campaigns. Those are just broad and auto campaigns that you're going to set up to start generating search terms. So Amazon will start to find search terms for your products, and uh, some of those will convert and some won't. And you can pick out the ones that do convert and put them in your regular manual campaigns in phrase and exact. So this is another strategy that most people are running early on. And it helps with keyword research, so I definitely recommend it. After that is generic. That's just advertising on keywords and ASINs that aren't yours. Uh, and that kind of expands like the keyword market share that you have. And that's where all of your sales are going to come from, or most of your sales are going to come from in the future. But initially, while you're still working to get momentum, your ACoS on those is going to be pretty terrible. So you want to kind of divide like a section of your budget or size off a section of that budget and put it towards generic or maybe even all of your budget if you don't really have branded traffic. But just keep in mind that generally uh, this is going to perform bad initially for you guys. Uh, after that, you have defensive. So you can run ads on your own ASINs. 
So you can just have this new product show up on their product detail page of another product that you sell. And again, people will be more forgiving about the fact that you have no reviews because they're already familiar with your brand. This is something else that you can do to kind of launch effectively. Uh, finally, we have automation. So the good news is all of this can be automated with like the keyword harvesting from search terms, the campaign setup, the keyword research and everything else. So in the AI hello tool, and this doesn't show all the campaigns that you can uh, create. It's just like a scroll bar here and I couldn't screenshot the entire thing, but you can set up like an auto campaign and have that automatically harvest out into your manual. You can set up like a sponsored uh, product exact campaign, a broad campaign, a phrase campaign. You can set up a defensive campaign, an ASIN targeting campaign, a uh, brand defense campaign. So you can do whatever you want over here and it takes like a couple of seconds and all the keywords are inputted for you automatically, right? So you just take everything, you put the budget in and you hit create and everything's done for you. And all of the research happens automatically, the defensive happens automatically, the harvesting happens automatically, keywords are added in for you, bids are changed for you and so on. So all of this is automatable through the tool. If you want to check it out, go to aihello.com. Uh, after that, you have a couple of things to avoid. So I'd probably avoid competitor keywords initially. Those are going to be pretty high cost per click. You're never going to rank for them. Or you might rank, but it's going to be like pretty far down on the page and you're not going to get serious traffic from them. Uh, and they're just not going to convert that well for you. So low conversion, expensive, and zero chance to rank organically, especially if you have no reviews, which is not something you want to spend on in a launch. After that, you have better ASINs. So when you start the ASIN targeting, probably after you get some reviews, so 50 plus reviews, you want to avoid targeting ASINs that are better than yours. So don't go after that guy with 10,000 reviews. Right? Don't go after that girl with like a price that's not lower than what you're offering right? with higher reviews. So you want to be careful with what you guys are targeting. Uh, after that, you have PPC budget. Um, so over here, if you guys like, like um, branded traffic or like an alternative review store or review source, uh, you are going to want to budget to break even, right? So if you have $10,000 worth of inventory, then you have a 30% gross margin after all the fees that Amazon takes besides ads. Uh, you want to plan to spend that 30% margin on ads, right? So with $10,000 of inventory, plan for a maximum budget of $3,000 across the period that you sell this product in, right? Generally, you should turn profitable on a good product by month three. Uh, so month one and month three, you'll be losing money. And then month three, you should be uh, either at break even or at profitable uh, profitability, sorry, which means your product is default alive because you don't have to keep burning money to keep it going. Uh, so once you reach that point, then you're good to go. But up until then, you want to budget your entire gross margin uh, for ads. Sometimes you won't have to spend all of that money on ads, but it's generally just like a good maximum and a good limit at the same time um, to kind of keep you... Uh, moving in the right direction. So don't spend more than 3,000. Like if you have been selling for two or three months and you've spent more than 3,000 to sell like $10,000 worth of inventory, maybe that's a sign that the product isn't moving that well. And at the same time, like don't go in expecting to uh, only spend 1,000 to move all these units, right? So it's just like a good benchmark. The actual number will differ, of course. Uh, after that, once you actually get this product off the ground and you have 1,000 plus monthly sessions, you can start A-B testing. Uh, so there are two things that you can primarily A-B test. There are obviously other things, but these are the two things I'd start with. At number one, it's titles. Um, so with titles, you want to change a few things to see if you can get a higher CTR. So you can change where the keywords are positioned. If you have like a hyper-relevant keyword, uh, you can move that to the beginning of the title. So it actually shows up and customers can click because of that. Or if you have a certain USP, you can move that into the beginning of the title again so people can see it. So you can try to differentiate by moving around keywords and USPs and attributes inside the actual title uh, to make it more relevant or to make it stand out more. After that, you can test your main images. And there are a couple of things you can test here. Uh, number one is product positioning. So over here, uh, what I mean by that is like the direction that the product faces in the actual image. So over here, uh, you can see that this product is facing the right while everything else is facing the left. So that's like a point of differentiation and it's probably going to catch your eye. And again, I use this same image as the example for the next one, which is colors. So over here, everything here is white besides this one. Um, and this one's like bright orange, right? And the uh, like spray hat is black. 
So it sketches your eye immediately, both because it's facing the opposite direction and because all of the colors are completely different, right? So that's something that catches your eye immediately. Uh, after that, you have labels and text. Um, so you can actually put text and labels on top of your product. It's kind of against terms of service, but you can still do it and nothing will happen. And this is a good example of that. So over here you have HP, which put like a piece of paper coming out of the printer, which actually says three months free ink. So if you're scrolling through the SERP for like, I don't know, um, printers, and you see this and it's like, oh wow, three months of free ink, you might click on that, right? You're probably gonna click on it. If the reviews and price are good, you probably are gonna click on that uh, versus like a product that doesn't have like three months of free ink. So you can actually use the main image to add like extra product attributes or just make it super clear that this is what the end customer is looking for. Uh, then finally, you can fill up white space. Uh, so over here, you can see this brand uh, selling like, a, I guess a de-stress supplement. They call it de-stress gummies. And they tried a couple different things to fill up white space. So they took the lid off and they put it on the side. They had a few gummies coming out of the top and a few by the bottle uh, on the right side. So, you know, all of these um, filled up some of the white space and also helped attract like the attention of different shoppers because all the other brands in the SERP were just like these big bottles that were sealed up and weren't really taking that much white space, right? So this kind of helps people uh, or helps like you get the attention of the shoppers that are scrolling fast. Uh, after that, you have tracking. Um, so the most important part of a launch is just analyzing your data to see if you're uh, performing well or if the performance is improving uh, week over week. So what I do is I track BSR. You can check this every couple of weeks and you want to see it go down because when it's going down, that means that you're growing at a faster rate than everyone else and you're gaining market share, which is essentially what you're trying to do with a product launch. So you want to make sure that every two weeks your BSR is progressing in the right direction. And at the same time, you want to track profit. So every two weeks, I'll just aggregate all of the data for ACOS tackles and net profit. And over time, you want to see your ACOS getting better every two weeks, your tackles getting better every two weeks, and your net profit, uh, or like your net loss maybe in the beginning, get better every two weeks, right? And you can split it out like, you know, these are my ad sales to these past two weeks. These were my organic sales. You want to see organic go up. And you obviously want to see ads go up and so on. So that's generally what I do. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I covered everything from like selecting the product, listing content, running ads, tracking, main images, A-B testing, and everything else. This is my entire playbook. This video is probably longer than uh, most other solo videos I'm going to release. It's something like 40 minutes. So I hope it's uh, it's been useful for you guys. And uh, we actually help people do this. So those 300 launches I men mentioned earlier happened uh, through our hybrid package, which is essentially a managed service package where we use our software plus a few other resources that we have uh, to automate your ads and set up campaigns and do everything else for you. So if you have a product you wanna launch or you just need general management of your ads, you can reach out to us at aihello.com. And if you mention the video in the actual like booking description of the call, I'll show up personally and give you a free audit. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you guys again next week. Have a great day.